This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to um, Monday Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. It's uh, good to see so many of our fellows here today. Um, today we have uh, Mon Jokadar, who all of you know. Mon is uh, a uh, assistant professor in the division, did his uh, initial uh, training in medicine in Syria, and uh, did his residency at the Mayo Clinic, and did his cardiology fellowship, and then his advanced uh, heart failure training here at Emory. I have no idea what this title is about. It is interesting. He tells me it's not about Dick Cheney and LVADs, so um, we'll see who it's about. Mon, it's all yours. This morning I want to share with you some stories that I hope you'll find interesting, thought-provoking, and hopefully a little bit fun. I'll leave some time in the end for some questions and hopefully we can generate a little bit of discussion. I have no conflicts of interest. Eleanor Roosevelt said, learn from the mistake of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. And this is what this talk is about. It's learning a little bit about the mistakes of others, also learning about the triumphs of others, and learning about how the illnesses of famous people and their medical care, and how this altered history. One of these three men has pulsus alternans the day this photograph is taken. Pulsus alternans, you may recall, is alternating of the intensity of the pulse. Strong pulse, weak pulse. This correlates strongly with severe cardiomyopathy, severe advanced heart failure, and portends a very poor prognosis. In fact, the patient here with pulsus alternans was dead within two months. And this person was the man sitting in the middle, and that was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This was during the Yalta Conference, which is one of the most important conferences, most important meetings of the 20th century. It occurred in April of 1945 on the Crimea of the, of the Black Sea. The man seated to Franklin Roosevelt's right is Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, and to his left, the man with a big mustache is Joseph Stalin. Franklin Roosevelt was dead in less than two months. This was a very important meeting. They were deciding how the face of Europe, the face of the world, would be after the conclusion of World War II. They were deciding how Europe would be partitioned, how Germany would be partitioned. And that day, the President of the United States was unfit for duty. He was just too sick. And he made enormous concessions to Stalin that reverberated for generations and affected millions and millions of people. So why did this happen? How did this happen? And I'll try to answer that here. We'll go back a little bit. This is Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt. They came from different sides of the Roosevelt family and they had different pronunciations to their names. And I'm not sure if she changed her name after they got married. Um, but um, he came from an affluent family and well-established family in New York. She was the niece of Teddy Roosevelt, who actually um, uh, gave her away at their wedding in 1905. This is shortly before. Franklin Roosevelt, at the age of 39 in 1921, contracted polio after swimming in a lake. There was a huge polio epidemic at the time, and he lost the use of his legs. This, in effect, terminated his political career. He did not feel that anyone would vote for a cripple. He did not feel that, uh, that sympathy or pity uh, were good for a political career. They were ruinous to a political career. And so, in an effort to regain the use of his legs, he traveled to a little town 
not too far from here, about 80 miles south of Atlanta, called Warm Springs. And he hoped that the waters, the minerals in these waters, would have some effect at helping him regain his legs. And in fact, he was the first to invent rehabilitation. He was able to rehab himself with the help of water and, and walking in the water uh, with a relative weightlessness and regain some strength. You see in this uh, picture in the right panel how atrophied his legs are. And with his success, um, many people came from near and far to, uh, to, to get therapy for polio and he started the first polio rehabilitation center. And later on in his pregnancy, he would start the March of Dimes, or what is later on known as the March of Dimes, uh, raising money for polio and other illnesses. And then, with a, re with a regaining of his, some use of his legs, he was able to walk with braces. He revived his political career. He became governor of New York, and then the president of the United States, 32nd president of the United States. This is about to... Somebody's trying to reach me here. President of the United States in 1933. America at the time was in the throes of a depression. One in four Americans were out of work. And uh, either because or in spite of his uh, government's spending, uh, New Deal poli policies, uh, there was some revival in about two years. It took a little bit longer than that, obviously. He was a heavy smoker and had, had historic hypertension. His blood pressure was always well above 200. However, despite this, the head White House physician was a man by the name of Ross McIntyre. Dr. McIntyre was an ENT specialist, and he was the head of ENT and I at that time at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. And the reason why an ENT was the, was the president's doctor is because the president's biggest troubles were his sinuses. And he uh, would require regular treatments. In fact, Dr. McIntyre would come once and even twice a day to administer local therapies to the president's sinuses and help him relieve his congestion. And I often wonder, could these treatments have contributed to his high blood pressure? Very little is written about what these treatments were. In 1944, the president's health took a turn for the worst. And he was also diagnosed with, with severe anemia a little bit before then. He had a hemoglobin, you see here, of 4.5 that was attributed to bleeding hemorrhoids. He did not require transfusion. He improved with, um, with uh, iron therapy. But he, his condition and his appearance continued to worsen over time. And in 1944, he, uh, he had a severe respiratory illness. He was very short of breath. It was difficult for him to, to breathe, and he had difficulty shaking this off. Dr. McIntyre attributed this to influenza, or a flu that he just wouldn't shake off. FDR's family were unsatisfied with this, and so they took him to the Bethesda Naval Hospital, the chief of cardiology, Dr. Howard Bruin. Um, this position, by the way, was later held by uh, Dr. Willis Hurst. So Dr. Bruin examined the president, determined that his blood pressure was very high, found that he had crackles in his lungs and peripheral edema, found that he had severe orthopnea and, and, and uh, severe uh, uh, dilation of his heart on chest x-ray, and diagnosed the president with congestive heart failure. They didn't have diuretics at that time. They had some mercury salts to help relieve congestion, but not a whole lot more. And Dr. Bruin recommended digitalis to the objection of Dr. McIntyre. Only until the president's condition worsened that digitalis was finally administered with improvements in the president's condition and he was discharged from the hospital. FDR was about to run for his fourth term as president. And he and his staff and the Democratic Party wanted to know 
was he fit to run for a fourth term? So they consulted with a number of doctors. The doctor on the left-hand panel is Dr. Frank Leahy, the founder of the Leahy Clinic. He was a legendary surgeon at the time. He, at one point, at the same point in time, was chief of surgery at both Tufts and Harvard simultaneously. Dr. Leahy was against the president running for a fourth term. He did not think he would survive a fourth term, and he, he confided with the president and his people about this, but did not make his information public. He did write a memorandum uh, that was released many years later uh, to that effect. And then the president saw Dr. James Edgar Pollan, who was here at Emory at the time. Uh, his picture is right outside, right outside this hallway. And Dr. Pollan was a student of William Osler at Johns Hopkins, and he was considered the first chairman of medicine here at Emory. He was uh, an eminent physician, very well respected, uh, uh, beloved by his, uh, by his patients and students, and um, there's a ward named after him here. There's a scholarship named after him here. He's uh, um, a very prominent person in Emory history. Dr. Pollan publicly encouraged the president to run for a fourth term. And why that is, is unclear. Was this political persuasion? Was this, um, was this for the good of the country? These are questions we really can't answer. So the president ran for a fourth term. He fired Wallace as his vice president, and Truman was the new vice president. And uh, uh, Truman may, may not otherwise have won the re-election against uh, Tom Dewey at the time. And then, as World War II was coming to an end, it was early 1945, the invasion of the Allies of Europe appeared to be successful, though uh, casualties were very heavy. The Pacific theater casualties were very high, but also things were going in the right direction. And so, the three superpowers needed to meet. Stalin refused to leave Russia, and the farthest west he would go was here on the Black Sea in the Crimea in a little town called Yalta. And this is where the, um, this historic conference took place. Here you see Winston Churchill, 80 years old, hobbling down, uh, hobbling down. Here's Molotov of Russia. And here's a very cachectic, weak-looking Franklin Roosevelt who can barely lift his arm. He has to rest his arm to shake hands with people. This, this trip took a tremendous toll on the president. And here you see Joseph Stalin sitting very, uh, very relaxed on his home turf, about to have his way with the Allies. So here they are, Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin. So <clears throat> they have some agreements about what to do, but basically Stalin gets everything he asks for, and uh, FDR uh, makes all the concessions. And these concessions are the borders of Europe after the war. Everything, everything to the east is given away. Everything from East Germany, the partition of East Germany, of, of Germany to East and West. Yugoslavia is given away. Uh, the only minor concession is that they, um, uh, the Allies get to keep Greece, which, which tries to go communist anyway at the time. Franklin Roosevelt convinces Russia to help in Japan, but only three months after the conclusion of the European theater. And at the time, Franklin Roosevelt had no had no uh, assurances that the nuclear bomb being built in Los Alamos was going, to be, uh, was going to be functional. Churchill's doctor knew how sick the president was, and he wrote in his diary, and this is uh, uh, Lord Moran, Lord Moran, um, to the doctor's eye, the president appears a sick man. He has all the symptoms of the hardening arteries of the brain and an advanced age so that I give him only a few months to live. After Yalta, the president returned to rest in Warm Springs to get his therapy, to get some rest. He spent some time with uh, 
as, as then secret mistress, Ms. Uh, Lucy Rutherford. And on April 12, 1945, while getting his portrait taken and while uh, sorting through correspondence, at about 1 p.m., he said, I have a terrific pain in the back of my head. Dr. McIntyre was not, was not there, but Dr. Bruin was. The president, within a few moments, lost consciousness. Dr. Bruin measured his blood pressure, which was extremely elevated, above 300, and he determined that the president probably bled in his brain. Dr. Pollan was summoned, and Dr. Pollan raced to Warm Springs from Atlanta. It took him about an hour and a half, two hours to, to get to Warm Springs. And when he arrived, just as he arrived, the president stopped breathing. So Dr. Pollan takes out a long syringe and injects adrenaline into the president's heart in an effort to revive him. This was not successful. So Truman becomes president, the European war is coming to a conclusion. Only less than three weeks after the death of Roosevelt, Mussolini and Hitler are both dead. And then in August 1945, the decision is made to drop the nuclear bomb on Hiroshima to put an end to the Pacific confrontation. Some historians have said that the failures of Yalta led to the necessity of dropping the bomb. I'm not sure I agree with that, and I'm not a historian, so I won't, I won't debate that. But the fact of the matter was, President Roosevelt was impaired that day. And his doctors, willing or unwilling, the political pressures, it was war, did aid in the cover-up of his health. And I feel that there is much to learn about this and much to discuss. My next story is a story of Lyndon Baines Johnson's heart attack. Lyndon Johnson grew up dirt poor in the dirt country of, or the hill country of uh, Texas. And he exclaimed from a very early age that he wanted to be president, very early age. And he followed his dream of becoming president. He was congressman, he was senator, and he became the, the earliest, the youngest uh, uh, Senate majority leader, Democratic Senate, Senate majority leader in history at the age of 47. And he became the Senate majority leader in, uh, in 1955. He was a very tall man, six, six foot three, six foot four, with long arms, and he would wrap them around his uh, political opponents and allies and use them for his persuasive powers. He was a very heavy smoker, drank a lot, and uh, didn't eat very healthy, was, was very overweight at the time, and all the male members of his family died at a young age from heart disease. And so, one day on July 2nd, 1955, Lyndon Johnson, the Senate Majority Leader, was out playing dominoes. It was a Saturday. He was out playing dominoes in Virginia, uh, in the suburbs of Washington. And he started having severe chest discomfort. He turned gray. He was short of breath. He had a few presyncopal spells. And he was rushed to the U.S. Naval Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. It so happened that the young chief of cardiology was on call that day, and he waited for him. And this young chief of cardiology, a 35-year-old cardiologist who trained with, uh, who trained at Mass General with Paul Dudley White, a man who grew up in Carrollton, Georgia, was there awaiting him, and that was Dr. Hurst, Dr. J. Willis Hurst. Dr. Hurst examined the Senate Majority Leader and was performing his EKG, and Johnson looked at him and said, what do you think? Hearst examined the long strip of paper that it was being spit out of the EKG machine. And he said, you're having a heart attack, sir. Johnson scowled at Hearst. And he 
narrowed his eyes and he looked at him. He was testing him. He was testing how confident he was. And he said, are you sure? And Hurst replied, yes. Yes, sir, I'm sure. That was the first of many tests for, uh, for Dr. Hurst and, uh, and confirmed that he was the right man for the job. Though Johnson was a very intimidating person, very persuasive person, he was unable to intimidate Hearst. Hearst ran the show when it came to uh, Johnson's medical care. Hearst was able to convince Johnson to quit smoking. He lost 60 pounds, which he kept off for the rest of his, most of his, of his life. Uh, he uh, dropped, dropped down the alcohol and the smoking. And, um, and he made it very difficult for Johnson while he was confined in the hospital for six weeks. That was the typical treatment of, of heart attacks at that time, being confined in the hospital for six weeks, mostly on bed rest. He forbade him from having radio and forbade him from having too many guests. So Johnson, with his persuasive powers, convinced him to get a radio to listen to country music. Obviously, he listened to the news the whole time. And he, uh, and he convinced him to have a few visitors. And when the visitor quota was exceeded, Hearst confronted him. And so Johnson said, oh, come on, doctor. You're not going to count Republicans now, are you? <laughs> and so around this time, around the conclusion of Johnson's um, hospitalization, Hearst completed his military obligations and was discharged with commendation. And he returns to Atlanta and uh, joined the Emory faculty. At, fir at first, he was at Grady. At the time, the Emory leadership the, of, of medicine was in shambles, and it did not appear to be a good place to work for Dr. Hurst. And so Dr. Hurst looked elsewhere, and he was recruited to the Mayo Clinic to start the medical school up there. And he went up for an interview, he really liked it, but then Emory gave him an offer he couldn't refuse. They offered him a uh, professor of medicine and they offered him to be chief of medicine. And uh, he retained this position until 1986. So around this time, Johnson left the hospital he was going to go down to I ranch. hope to uh, come back to Atlanta in December and then to go out to Mayo's in Minnesota uh, from Atlanta. And if the doctors uh, give me the okay, I'll be back on the job uh, in the Senate uh, when the Senate reconvenes in January. In the meantime, no politics and on to the rocking chair. Well, I wouldn't say that uh, you could take politics completely away from me, but uh, we'll have it at a minimum. Good, good, thing. Good, good luck. Good Thank good all of you for being so nice to me. And so Johnson went back to work. Here he is with uh, Georgia's uh, Richard Brevard Russell doing his persuasive powers. Initially, Brevard Russell was Johnson's boss. And initially, Johnson was very uh, obsequious for him. He would, he would, he would uh, uh, scrape and bow to this great man. And then, and then over time, the tables were turned, and uh, Johnson uh, was was showing his, uh, his former boss his persuasive powers. And then, um, eventually, Johnson became the uh, vice president. And then on one fateful day, on November 22nd, 1963, he became president of the United States after Kennedy's assassination. And here he is on Air Force One. To his right is Lady Bird Johnson, and to his left is Jacqueline Kennedy, with her uh, blood-stained pink um, suit. Hearst would remain Johnson's cardiologist until his death in 1973, Johnson's death in 1973. And Johnson, on several occasions, tried to convince Hearst on becoming the White House physician. And he very politely refused. Very difficult thing to refuse the United States uh, and LBJ, nonetheless, who never took no for an answer. 
but he still refused. He wanted to be here at Emory uh, building what we, what we have here today. And um, um, that was a good decision, I think. My next story is about the dangers of wishful thinking. And this is about the heart attack of Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower was the mastermind of the World War II invasions of Africa and of Northern Europe. He became the first um, Allied, uh, Allied Supreme Commander and uh, a NATO Supreme Commander. And then he was eventually elected president in 1953. He was a very heavy smoker. He was a, a chimney, more than three packs a day. Nobody knew exactly how much he smoked. And, uh, but he was able to, to quit a few years before. He had a ferocious temper. And he was a master leader. He knew when to micromanage and he knew when to delegate. And he knew the balance and he knew when to implement each strategy of leadership. And with time, his staff became so well trained that he had lots of time for golf. And he golfed more than just about any president before or after. And then on September 24th, 1955, it started out as a good day. He was out in Denver visiting his in-laws. His, uh, his mother-in-law his mother uh, lived in Denver, Colorado, and he was there on vacation and he played some golf. For lunch, he had a hamburger with some uh, onions, and he felt a little bit of what he thought was heartburn that afternoon. And then that night for dinner, he had dinner in this house that still stands today on 750 Lafayette Street in Denver, Colorado. This was the house of his mother-in-law, uh, Ms. Uh, Elvira, Elvira uh, Dowd. He was sitting for dinner. His doctor was sitting at dinner with him, and he started having more chest discomfort, and he just wasn't feeling good. And his doctor, Dr. Snyder, reassured him, everything is fine, everything is fine. And so the president retired to bed in this, uh, in this house, and in the middle of the night, he woke up with even more chest pain. And now he was short of breath, and he was diaphoretic and very weak. So Dr. Snyder was called to his bedside, Dr. Snyder's records indicate that he had correctly diagnosed a heart attack. Dr. Snyder's notes indicate that he administered heparin to thin the blood and papaverin to dilate the coronary arteries. That was the standard treatment at that time. However, there are many inconsistencies in Dr. Snyder's documentation. He never re-dosed the, the, uh, the president after three and four hours. He spent all night at the president's bedside and only administered one dose of this therapy. And so the following day, Dr. Snyder called for help. He, called, he did not call for help during this time. Can you imagine sitting at the bedside of the President of the United States in a house without medical care, without anyone around you, just supporting the President of the United States heart attack by yourself? Historians later on would, uh, would uh, suggest that Dr. Snyder falsified his documentation and in fact had misdiagnosed the president of having, of having heartburn and sat on it all night. So the president was taken to Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center just down the street from, uh, from uh, uh, Ms. Dowd's residence and an EKG was performed and they determined that the president had a very large anterior myocardial infarction. And so the current head of cardiology at the Naval Hospital, U.S. Naval Hospital in Washington and Beth in Bethesda, Maryland was Thomas Mattingly. And Thomas Mattingly was also a student of Dr. Hurst. Uh, he was, uh, pardon, a student of Paul Dudley White. He trained one year ahead of him. And so Dr. Mattingly called in his former mentor, Dr. Uh, Paul Dudley White. And the president was diagnosed with an LV aneurysm and warfarin was administered. 
Warfarin until very recently was rat poison. It was rat poison. And only a few months beforehand had it been approved for human use. And Eisenhower was one of the first people to have warfarin administered as a medicine. He was given 35 milligrams of warfarin uh, a week. And he had strict bed rest. And over time, the president's condition improved. This is him uh, near the end of his, uh, of his hospitalization. And the president went on to run for another term in office. He did have a number of strokes during his, uh, during his uh, uh, presidency, which were kept from the public. And at some points in time, he was probably altered and unfit for duty. Um, uh, and this was in the height of the Cold War. He wouldn't die until 1969, after having many heart attacks and many strokes. He had been resuscitated a number of times and finally uh, succumbed to heart failure uh, many years into his illness. And here is uh, Eisenhower and White at the International Cardiology Foundation meeting in 63. And uh, White remained his cardiologist for the duration. And White himself, I believe, had strokes later on. My next story is not cardiology. My next story, but I think this is my favorite story. And uh, this is about the death of a princess. And I'm talking about the death of Princess Charlotte, um, who, was the, um, who was a British princess in 1817. She was a very popular woman at the time. Uh, historians compared her to a modern Lady Diana. She was beautiful, she was energetic, she uh, was very nice to her subjects, and she married uh, Prince Leopold, and soon uh, was pregnant with, um, with a child. She was in line for the throne, and there were no other suitable, suitable people uh, uh, who, who would be monarch. This is her during her pregnancy, shortly before her death in 1817. And her akashur, or uh, male midwife, who was actually an MD, was Dr. Uh, Richard Croft, who graduated from Oxford in 17, uh, 1789. And he was also one of the physicians to King George III. You may recall King George III is the man who may or may not have porphyria, and the man who squandered the American colonies to, this, uh, to the American Revolution. Um, as far as I know, there's no relation to Lara Croft. <laughs> and so she was confined here at uh, the Claremont House in the uh, British countryside. And her doctor, Dr. Croft, very dig diligently um, kept, kept her a calorie restricted to avoid excessive weight gain and bled her frequently um, I'm not sure why, but he, he, he wanted to, uh, uh, that was standard of care at the time, I guess. And so, um, in, the, in her 42nd week, she goes into labor. Very difficult labor. The baby was probably transverse or, um, or breech presentation. The first stage of labor lasted 24 hours. It wasn't until then that he called for help. He called the help of Dr. John Sims, who was an expert at the using, uh, using forceps and other surgical techniques to aid in delivery. As far as I know, uh, John Sims has no relation to our own Danny Sims. Um, and, uh, and so they decided not to do anything and let nature take its course. Nature did take its course, and after 50 hours of labor, a stillborn male prince was delivered, and shortly thereafter, the princess died. She may have died of, uh, she had severe abdominal pain. It is likely that she had uterine rupture, but, but may have had infection, pulmonary embolus, or any number of complications. So why do we care about this? Well, everyone was very saddened by the death of the princess. There was no heir to the throne. And everyone criticized Dr. Croft for the way he managed the case. Some people said, well, he could at least 
save the baby with a cesarean section, save the heir to the throne. He could have used forceps. He could have done this. He could have done that. And this weighed on Dr. Croft very heavily. And a few months later, he went back to work and he was delivering babies. He found himself in a very similar situation. This is from the Sydney Gazette at that time. And he was, um, he was delivering a Ms. Thackeray, very difficult delivery. And then he had what appears to be an acute nervous breakdown. He retired to his chamber in the, in, in the uh, patient's house. Uh, at that time, people of wealth had chambers for their, for their delivering doctors. And in that chamber, there were two guns. He loaded both guns, and he shot himself simultaneously with both guns. Miss Thackeray did okay. She delivered spontaneously on her own. Um, uh, one, of, uh, one of Dr. Croft's co-workers uh, helped deliver the baby, but she did just fine. So this was what's called the triple tragedy. The death of the princess, the death of a newborn prince, and the death of the doctor. So how does this influence us today? Well, you see here, this is Princess Charlotte, and all her uncles didn't really have any suitable heirs. So there was a vacancy for the future heir of the British crown. And so all her uncles started racing to produce an heir. And Edward, the Duke of Kent, amended things with his estranged wife and produced a young girl by the name of Victoria. You may have heard of her. She ended up being Queen Victoria and reigned for 50 years and presided over a long time of prosperity and evolution of the uh, British, uh, British monarchy and British way of doing things. She had lots of kids and lots of grandkids. She was called the mother of Europe. Her grandchildren included the monarchs of Germany and Prussia and Russia and Spain and Holland and Denmark and Norway. And during World War I, they would divide up and fight against each other. And uh, one of the adjutants was a guy by the name of Prince William II, or Kaiser Wilhelm II, as he was known. And he was, many historians attribute World War II to his mismanagement. He fired Bismarck and did other things we won't get into, but he, uh, if it wasn't for Kaiser Wilhelm, there may not have been a World War I at that time. There may have been a World War I at a different time, but not, not in the shape that it took. Another twist of history is that the queen had a faulty X chromosome. And people with two duplicates of this X chromosome, or pardon, one duplicate of this X chromosome uh, that was autosomal dominance, had a tendency to bleed, including Alexis, the heir to the uh, Tsar of Russia. Imagine how different the face of Russia would be if you had a healthy heir who wasn't uh, bleeding all the time. And uh, many, of, many of her other grandkids died at young age as well from hemophilia. So I think that's an interesting story about you know, how the decision not to use forceps uh, altered the course of history for billions of lives. My last story is about George Washington, who was uh, the man who would not be king. George Washington was the leader of the American Revolution, the very first president of the United States, the man who allowed for the very first peaceful transition of power after the end of his presidency. The first of, Obama's the 44th, the first of 43 peaceful transitions of power, something we really shouldn't take for granted. He was a tall man, very robust, had many illnesses throughout his lifetime. His face was pockmarked from smallpox that he survived as a child. Obviously, this does not, no, no artist would show their subject as having a pockmark. 
He survived tuberculosis. He survived malaria. He survived various bacterial infections. He survived dysentery during Valley Forge. He survived all these illnesses. However, near the end of his lifetime, he was starting to fade. He lived here on Mount Vernon. He continually tried to build and, uh, and improve, uh, improve uh, on the grounds. And he was always supervising and uh, walking around, sometimes doing work himself. He was a very, very strong, very... Uh, he had horrible teeth. And he wore ill-fitting dentures. And as a result, he never smiled. And he limited his public speaking. And so, about two years after he left office, on a cold, snowy December day in um, 1799, he came in from, a, from riding in the snow, and he, when he came in that evening, he found that he had dinner guests. He always had dinner guests that were unexpected and uninvited. Um, people flocked after uh, the end of his presidency to Mount Vernon to, uh, to be able to, ch to have a chance to meet with the president and have dinner with him and sometimes stay at Mount Vernon. He was always courteous. So that night when he came in, his clothes were wet. He had snow on his hair. Uh, he never wore a wig. That was, that's just myth. That, that's his own hair that he uh, always powdered. He had snow on his hair. And instead of waiting, or instead of waiting for his, uh, or making his, Guests wait for him to change. He sat down to dinner in his cold, damp clothes and spent the evening with them. The following day, Washington had a sore throat. And over the course of the day, he, it was difficult for him to speak. It was difficult for him to breathe. He was becoming hoarse. He was feeling very bad. His doctors were summoned and they tried to give him some and they tried to give him some, um, uh, some gargles and stuff, but he just ended up choking on these things. So they ended up bleeding him. They bled him once, then they bled him again, and there was no improvement. And so Washington insisted upon being bled again and again. His doctors objected. They did not think that bleeding so much blood was safe. But they did it anyway. And they bled off five pints of blood, which is about half of a body volume, a third to a half of body volume off of the president. And this weakened his state. This weakened his state, and he died an agonizing death, suffocating to death, essentially, uh, after about two days of illness. And so, he probably died of epiglottitis. Would he have survived without the interventions of his doctors? It's possible. Um, but the bleeding definitely didn't help. And so it's hard to criticize, go back in history and criticize doctors for their decisions. But medicine is not a precise science. Medicine is a series of judgment calls, weighing the risks and benefits of various things. And so in this environment where we're making judgment calls, what we rely on is our judgment. And if we go against our judgment, what else do we as physicians have? And this is true, this is true of this situation, true of other situations as well. Good doctors, well-respected doctors, who went against their own judgment in the face of a very powerful and strong figure. And so, with this in mind, trying to figure out what is it about a VIP that makes them a VIP? What is it about a VIP that makes them vulnerable for substandard care? So first, let's think about the definition of a VIP. Eleanor Mariano, who was the treating physician of three presidents, defined a VIP as a very intimidating patient. <laughs> very intimidating patient. A patient who makes the doctor nervous. They make the doctor nervous because the doctor now has more skin in the game than, than they ordinarily would. So what is a very intimidating patient? It could be a politician, president, celebrity, a wealthy person who you want to get a professorship from. 
It could be a friend, a family member, another physician. It could be that rude patient that we always avoid and that we all have on our panels, the rude patient who is very demanding. These are VIPs. These patients lead to deviation of standard of care. These patients, the VIP patients, become VPs. They become vulnerable patients. And there is a lot written about this. I have my own thoughts, but I was hoping to get yours about this. But my conclusion to what makes a VIP a VIP is nothing, if you didn't know who this patient was, your treatment would probably be the same. It would probably not deviate from the standard of care. So there's nothing special about that patient. What's special is how you treat yourself around that patient. So if we learn to treat ourselves the same around VIP patients, I'm not talking VIP presidents, I'm talking about the patients we see every day, then maybe we can deliver better care to these patients. So I'll conclude here, and I'd like to thank Matt Certain for his help on the audiovisual, Dr. Uh, Robbie Williams, Stephen Clements, for uh, helping me uh, bounce things off of, Jonathan Morrow for uh, loaning me some of his slides, and obviously uh, Dr. Larry Sperling also for helping me uh, formulate, uh, uh, formulate uh, this topic. And with that, uh, these are some references and additional readings, and with that I'm happy to entertain questions, but I'd love some discussion from the audience. Thanks, man. That was a lot of fun. Um, the FDR story is particularly, I guess, uh, interesting to those of us who live in Georgia. And any of you who haven't been down to Warm Springs, it's, it's sort of worth a visit. And it's also worth looking, I think it was a New England Journal article that sort of plotted out FDR's blood pressures. And it was it's the natural history of untreated hypertension. They show progressive proteinuria, LVH on EKG. It's a fascinating story. Um, we're open to questions or comments or other stories of, uh, of VIPism. There, you have to, you got to use a microphone. Hang on, we'll get you one. That was excellent. Thank you very much for putting that all together. Um, what's the current state of affairs for declaring a president to be incapacitated? I mean, who makes the call? And uh, I think all elected presidents are incapacitated. And why didn't anyone do that to Reagan? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's, uh, it's one of the, it's, there's an amendment in the Constitution about this, but I don't know the details and how that determination is made. Yeah, I'm reminded of a story. Uh, Kurt Canner, one of our uh, surgeons, told me one time when he was in London that uh, there was a famous surgeon there who case uh, except for closing the patient's chest and he's leaving the room and somebody said now sir you just operate on a member of the royal family aren't you going to close the chest and he looked and he said I haven't closed the chest in 20 years I'm certainly not going to start <laughs> with a member of the royal family <laughs> and I do think that that's important for us to realize there and particularly in, in today's practice where so much of our processes involve multiple team members uh, and where when we deviate from that team structure um, that we're putting ourselves in a position where where we're not doing things that we're used to doing and, and therefore we have the potential to either miss things or uh, through deviation of processes to have errors in, in our in our judgment but it is something that we're all vulnerable to I don't need a microphone. You got to use the mic over there. What about President Wilson? Hang on. You got to use the mic. So, so the question was, what yeah. about President Wilson? So, uh, President Wilson uh, was incapacitated from a stroke uh, during his presidency, and that was uh, that was a very large cover-up related to that. And uh, I did not include that in today's uh, in today's uh, topic. It didn't have as much influence on world affairs as some of the as some of the other ones, but that is a very interesting, uh, and there's, there's much written about, about uh, what happened and how that happened. Also, the, uh, you know, some other presidents uh, were also incapacitated during their presidency, and that was covered up uh, as well. Okay. 
Okay, well, Mon, thanks so much for a fantastic talk. Really good. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.